Well, good morning. It is so good to see each and every one of you here this morning. And uh, we are uh, so thankful that each and every one of you can be here this morning. And ladies, there is a flower for each and every one of you out in the foyer area on the way out. And uh, we want every one of you ladies to have one of those. And uh, let it be a blessing to you and a reminder that you are loved here at Harvest. And um, just so I don't have to say it 27 times, I'll give you a little bit of update. Every day is a better day, right? Amen. Um, so, uh, yeah, yesterday was a good day. I always say if I have a really good day, the next day is really bad. Because you overdo it, right? You feel good, so you keep doing, overdoing it. But so far, things are good today. I had a good day yesterday and a good day today and not in a ton of pain and not sucking on pain pills, so that's a good day, right? So God is good. I, I said earlier this morning, I said, God's Word says the prayers of a righteous man availeth much. I'm not sure which of you is righteous, but if you are, just keep at it. Just keep at it. Because I want the prayers uh, answered. And um, I've, as I said last week, there's times I feel like I've failed in all this. I'm so impatient. I want to just get this over with. And yet God's saying, no, not yet. You have a little more time. Don't worry about it. And I'm like, okay, okay. I, I want it done with. But uh, thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your encouragement. Thank you for the phone calls, the texts, and all that stuff. I just appreciate every single prayer. And uh, God is answering, and I'm so grateful for that. And uh, hopefully, pray for this. If everything goes well, I get my pick line out on Wednesday. So Wednesday would be the last day of three IVs a day, six in the morning, two in the afternoon, and ten at night. And it uh, takes about two hours and 20 minutes every time I do it. So it's been early mornings and late nights for the last weeks. And hopefully everything goes good and the blood work comes back good. I'm done Wednesday. Can't wait. I've been carrying around this thing that's inside. I, you know, the other, I, you have this weird sensation. I woke up at like 3 in the morning the other night and I just wanted to rip this thing out of my arm. It's like, it's like obviously you won't, but it's like I just want, I just want this out. And it's like, okay, Lord, you got to take care of this because I just want to rip it out. And uh, obviously you can't do that, so it's there for your good and it's, just, it's like it's not normal to have things sticking in your arm for six weeks or eight weeks or whatever it is. So uh, just pray everything goes well and I get it out. But thank you for every prayer, every encouragement. It's been such a blessing. I, I have, I'm telling you, I have the best church family ever. Seriously, you guys are like, you guys rock. Thank you so much. So this morning, um, I've been asking God, what do you want me to preach on? I, my comfort zone is, is, you know, I like going through books. But then every once in a while, God takes you away from the books to dwell on some topics. And uh, I made a commitment this year to read through the Bible this year again. And I've done that for years and years and years. But uh, with all this that came up, uh, um, I think I'm, according to you version, I'm about 60 days behind. And uh, so two months, and so I've been hitting pieces, but part of it was because every time I tried to read, it's like the page, words are all over the page, I couldn't focus. Um, my eyes were going in and out, and then I, I grabbed the booklet that they give you after heart surgery, and like number three, don't be surprised if your eyes don't focus. I'm like, okay, so that's part. That's why. So you can't read, and your go, eyes are going in and out. At least for me, it just it was a struggle trying to read, and I couldn't do. It. I had a stack of books. I thought, I'm going to read these books while I'm recuperating. Nah, it didn't happen. And so I made a determination this week that now that things are improving and I can read better, that I'm going to start getting back. And I said, okay, Lord, what do you want me to preach on? And uh, immediately he takes me to you know where I'm starting to pick up in my getting through the Bible in a year program and he really just stops me at Matthew chapter 14 and so that's where we're going to be this morning so if you have your Bibles this morning turn to Matthew chapter 14 I'm going to read the first several verses and then we'll pray and uh, draw from it what God has for us this morning Matthew chapter 14 and I'm going to begin reading verse 22 it says immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side well, he sent the crowds away, and after he had sent the crowds away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray, and when it was evening, he was there alone. But the boat was already stadia away from the land, being battered by the waves, for the wind was against him, and the 
Fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. Now when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost, and they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. Lord Jesus, as we come before you this morning, we ask God that you would speak to our hearts. We ask God that you would challenge us, but not only challenge us, change us through your word. And I ask God that we would be honest with ourselves this morning, Lord, that we would, Lord, not just acknowledge areas that may apply to our hearts and our lives, Lord, that that need to change, but Lord, to really honestly be willing to do something about it and to make the changes with your help, Lord, with the Holy Spirit's help, Lord, to be the people that you've called us to be, to be the church that you've called us to be. So I ask God that you would speak to our hearts, draw us closer to you. And uh, Lord, as we pray often, Lord, Lord, around the world, there's already many countries who've already had their morning service. There are other countries who have yet to have their service. But I pray that wherever the Word of God goes forth this day, Lord, that Your Word would accomplish Your will. And Lord, that people would respond to it according to Your will. And Lord, I just pray that it have its intended effect on lives, Lord, as they are underneath the preaching of Your Word. So God, speak to our hearts here at Harvest. And Lord, in our area here around Rochester. And uh, Lord, with each one that's here today, God, I pray that You would not only challenge us, but change us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As I'm looking at this passage, there's something that really drew out this time. And I know many of you can relate that maybe there's a passage that you've read through many, many times, but every time you read from that same exact passage, there's something different that jumps off the page that didn't jump off the page last time. And that's kind of the way it hit me this time. You know, Jesus sends the group of His disciples out into the boat before Him to the other side. We see that right away in verse 22 that he is immediately just sending the group of disciples out to the other side. In fact, the Bible says, and if you read closely in many of your translations, it says that Jesus made them go. Now that's interesting to me. I I never picked up on that before, and I don't know exactly all the nuances of it, but it says very clearly, it says immediately he made the disciples go. Now, the word made really has several different connotations. Uh, in some of your translations, it may say that he constrained them to go, or compelled them to go, or persuaded them to go. But in the Greek language, it actually has the idea of he necess- necessitated to them that they were to go out in this boat and go to the other side. But he made them go. But the whole word made presupposes the idea that maybe they didn't want to go. I, I don't know why. I don't know why maybe they didn't want to go. I don't know why Jesus made them go, but Jesus made them get into the boat and made them go out to the sea and go to the other side. So I don't know all the whys behind it, but I thought that was interesting. How many times has God had to make us do something we wouldn't have naturally done on our own? Anybody ever been there in that situation before? If He not, had not made me go, I wouldn't have done it. In fact, you know, there's a lot of things in life that we wouldn't go except for somebody make us go do it. And so Jesus is making his disciples, this group of disciples, get in the boat and go out to the other side. But consider something in this passage here. Most often when we hear messages on this text, it centers upon who? Peter. Almost every time you hear a message and Matthew chapter 14, it centers around the idea of Peter because Peter is the one who got out of the boat and actually dared walk on the water out to you know, where Jesus was. But I found another interesting facet as I was reading through this this week. Um, I want to challenge you to consider just who it was that Jesus was speaking to. He was actually addressing the group of disciples, wasn't he? He wasn't necessarily addressing Peter although he was in the group and though the story often centers upon him, he was actually addressing the group. He was actually addressing all the disciples and he spoke to the group, not necessarily the individuals. And so for a moment today, I'd like for us to consider the group aspect of this text. So let me give you a few observations or questions to ponder for a moment. And this is kind of a key phrase I've been saying for the last several weeks. Let me give you some things to chew on. Some questions to ponder in your mind as we're looking at this text of Scripture. So let me give you at least three of them. Uh, Did Jesus know what He was asking of His disciples? Well, of course He did. 
Every time Jesus asked his disciples or made his disciples do something, he knew what he was asking of them. He knew what he was telling them to do. He knew what it entails. He's God in flesh, right? He's God incarnate. And if he's God incarnate, he's omniscient and he knows all things. And there's nothing God doesn't know. Therefore, there's nothing Jesus doesn't know. He knew exactly what it entails by telling his disciples to get in boat and go on the other side. Number two, did Jesus know what obstacles his disciples would face? Of course he did. He's God. And if he knew exactly what it was going to entail in walking across the, or I mean going out into the water in this boat, he knew exactly what the obstacles are. And to this group, there were many obstacles as you're soon going to find out. And did you know that, did Jesus know what would hinder their obedience? Of course he did. He's God. He's Jesus incarnate. He's in the flesh, right? He's right there. He knew exactly what obstacles they would face. You know, let me just think about this for a moment. Did Jesus know what he was asking of his disciples? He's a sovereign God, right? Um, let me just give you a couple verses to consider when it comes to the sovereignty of God. First of all, in Psalm chapter 115, verse 3 says, Our God is in heaven and does whatever he pleases. You know, God is sovereign. He can do whatever he wants. We've said this many times over the years. He doesn't need any of our permission, you know, permission from any of us. He doesn't need to get our thoughts, our opinions, our feelings about whatever it is that he wants us to do. He's up in heaven right now doing whatever he pleases because he can. He's God. Isn't that amazing? I mean, nobody has to tell him what to do and nobody has to give him their opinions. He's God. You know, in Psalm chapter 33, verses 10 and 11, it says, The Lord frustrates the counsel of the nations. He thwarts the plans of the people. The counsel of the Lord stands forever and the plans of his heart are from generation to generation. He orchestrates the plans of man. We have this idea, and I've talked to several preachers, and one in particular in this area said, well, God doesn't do that. Yes, He does, according to Scripture. It says He frustrates the counsel of the nations and thwarts the plans of people. The best laid out plans. God says, wait a minute. Have you counseled me with what your plans are? Have you talked to me about what my plans for you are? Have you talked to me about what I desire of your life? And over and over, man makes up their own ideas, their own plans, their own agendas. And God's like, huh, I don't think that's quite how it's going to go. Anybody ever figured that out just yet? I mean, God just some, some, sometimes puts a detour right in the middle of your path. and says, nope, <laughs> why don't you go this way? God's sovereignty is for a purpose. It brings Himself joy. And when God has something for us to do, it's not always necessarily for our own purposes, although there is a purpose in it for us. Primarily, He does it because it brings Himself joy. In fact, in Isaiah chapter 46, verses 9 and 10, it says, I declare the end from the beginning, and from long ago what is not yet done, saying, My plan will take place, and I will do all my will. I mean, here's God saying, My plan will happen. And nobody's going to not make my plan happen. And so he has a reason. He says, I will do my will. He says, I call a bird of prey from the east and a man from my purposes from a far country. Yes, I have spoken, so I will also bring it about. God says, what I plan will take place. Isn't that amazing? He doesn't need our permission. He doesn't know how to get our feelings on what he's asked us to do. It's for himself that he tells us to do it. And over and over, God is doing this for His own joy. And not only that, whatever He does is pleases with mankind. So look at Job 42 too. It says, I know that you can do anything and no plan of yours will be thwarted. God says, I, or I mean, He says, I know that you, God, can do anything. Let me ask this question. Would God give you a command and not give you the wherewithal to do it? Thank you. It wasn't a hard test, I promise you. God does not tell us to do something and then not wherewithal, give us the wherewithal to do it. He says, oh, by the way, be holy as I'm holy, but you'll never do it. That would be a narcissistic, crazy God we serve. He says, I'm going to give you the wherewithal to do what I ask you to do. And when he told the group of disciples to get out in the boat and go to the other side, he empowered them to do what they had to do. Their only job was what? Obedience. And we see this over and over. One of my favorite stories in all of Scripture in the Old Testament, when he says, I'm going to send you spies into the land of Canaan, and I want you to look at everything. And man, they got such this 
glorious report. He said, man, the soil here is awesome. It's the best soil any farmer could ever want. I mean, the crops that came, the harvest that is there, these grapes of Eshco and the figs that are there, everything about it is just absolutely incredible. The best I've ever seen, the best I could ever imagine. But, there's always a but, right? In the mind of man. Not necessarily in the mind of God, but in the mind of man, there's always a but. He says, but the men are as giants. But there's walls around the city. But, but, but. There's always a but to contend with. But God says, wait a minute. I want you to go spy out the land that I am what? Giving you. See, he was already foreseen what God was going to do. He says, I want you to go check out this land that I'm giving you. It's like, hey, I'm going to give you a a 12-bedroom mansion that's over there in a secluded, gated community. I want you to go check it out. It's like, nah, it's too good to be true. I'm not doing it. They were giving it, everything to them, and they just couldn't accept it. That God would actually do this. Over and over, God does what He does, and man's not going to thwart His plans. Well, Lamentation chapter 2, verse 11 talks about all the calamity that's taken place. And, you know, everything that takes place, and God says, I'm going to help you through all of it. We won't take the time to look at all of this. Um, over and over, God is a sovereign God who can do whatever He wants. In Psalm, and Pro, I'm sorry, Proverbs chapter 16, verse 33 says, The law is cast into the lap, but, it's every, de- but every decision is from the Lord. Folks, we have to get back to the place that when God asks us to do something, it's for a reason. And the reason is often for His own glory in our good. In every circumstance, it's for His glory and our good. God knows what He's doing with our lives. He doesn't make mistakes with them, right? So we have to realize that when God sent His disciples, his, this small group, out into the boat, He knew what He was asking of them. He knew what was going to be required of them. He knew that they would face obstacles. And He knew what would hinder their obedience. But I want you to consider something just for a minute. A few more thoughts. In verse 24, it gives us another key to the story. It says, But the boat was already many stadia away from the land, being battered by the waves, for the wind was against them. There was a storm out on the water. Imagine that. Remember? God already knew what He's going to ask of them. He knew what they would encounter. He knew it would hinder their faith. But the reality, or their, their obedience... But the reality is, he knew that there'd be a storm. And every time God asks us to do something, he knows what we're going to encounter. And not only that, verse 25 (laughs) says, And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. There was a sense of terrible timing. So there, there was a storm out on the water. There's a sense of terrible timing. I don't know about you, but every time God has asked us to do something, it seems like there's a timing issue. I don't know about you, but I I can remember in my life, every time God asked me to stop what I'm doing to help somebody else, the timing stinks. Because I've got my agenda. I've got my to-do list. I remember a couple years ago, I was going down East Henrietta, and I look over to the right, and there's a guy, basically, you know how the old manual Honda Accords were, you know, like early 90s. You kind of, you know, if it won't start, you kind of run, you know, push it real hard, and then jump in and pop the clutch. Anybody ever lived long enough to do one of those? Some of you remember those. So I look over, and there's this guy trying to push his Honda and then jump in and pop the clutch to get it going. I'm on my way to Walmart, of all places. I have to go get something for my kids for school the next day. It's 9.45, almost 10 o'clock at night. It's like, oh man, that guy, uh, really? You know how it is. In your mind, the wheels are already turning. You should probably stop and help him. I don't want to stop and help him. I'm on my way to Walmart. I got things to get at Walmart. I got, it's, it's already late. I'm tired. Yeah, but you should probably go help that guy. I know I should probably do that, but that's not my problem. It's his problem. But you should probably go help him. 
I, I don't really want to help them. I'm tired. But you should probably go help them. You know how it is. You have that, like it's an audible conversation with God saying that you're not going to do it and here's why. Anybody ever had one of those conversations? And now I'm about a mile past them. I can justify it now because I'm past them. Out of sight, out of mind. Not out of mind. I'm like, ah, oh, shoot. So I turn the car around, I go back, and I give him a little push, and he jumps in, you know, gives me a high five and takes off. I don't know about you, but it seems like every time God asks us to do something, there's a timing issue. Because my agenda, my to-do list, seemingly is getting in the way. I don't know about you, but it's never a good time to see what appears to be a ghost walking on the water in the middle of the night. I can justify going away from that. So here they are. They're out in the boat. In the fourth watch of the night. And they see what appears to be a ghost. And then number three, there is a real sense of fear. And it wasn't just with the individual. It was with the group of disciples. Look at verse 26. It says, Now when the disciples saw Him walking on the sea, they were terrified. They were troubled. And they cried out in fear because they thought they were seeing a ghost. I don't know about you, but it sounds like a good reason to leave. But you know, here's the thing. Jesus knew what He was asking of them. He knew what obstacles they'd be facing. And He knew what would hinder their obedience. Just for a moment, I don't want it to be about Peter. I want it to be about the group. And if I could just for a moment just kind of beg Scripture a little bit to draw an application out of it, I want us to be the group. The church. The church is made up of individuals, right? It's Exia, it's the called out ones, those of you that know Jesus Christ as your Savior. You've put your faith and trust in Him. We're the group. We're the church. Just for a moment, I want us to think about us being the group. That God has told us to do something. You've heard the phrase, many hands make light work. I wonder what would be different if we would all jump in when God asks us to do something. I'm thinking about what God has done in this church over the last almost 50 years. Not quite. We'll have a celebration coming up here, I think, in a couple years. Got to get with the powers that be and figure that out. <laughs> but over these last many years, what has God done? He's brought people in. He's removed some people and they've moved, been moved out. There's been different things that God has done over the years to see people saved and baptized and added to the church. But I've often said this. I hope our best days are not behind us. If our best days are behind us, we might as well just go home and forget it. There's nothing more to look forward to. Anybody agree? I mean, if our best days are behind us, what more do we have to look forward to? There's going to be no more big days. There's no going to be no more exciting things to happen. God's done work and our best days are behind us. We might as well just go home. But just for a moment, I want us to think about us as the group. What has God asked us to do whereby He didn't know what He was asking of us? Of course He knows what He's asking of us as a church. We can read through Acts chapter 2 and find all kinds of things that God has asked the church to do and to be. Just for a moment, did Jesus know what obstacles that we'd face as a church in walking out and carrying out those areas of obedience? Of course He does. He knows the obstacles that we'll face as a group of believers, as a group called the church. And number three, Jesus knows what will hinder us as a church from going forward and walking in complete obedience to what He's asked of us. I hope our best days are yet to come. Amen? I hope that our best... You know, I'm going to say it. I've actually had a couple of the older folks in this church say this. Well, I kind of like the size of our church. I really don't want it to grow. Shame on you. Shame on you. It's not about the size of the church. It's about God still doing a work in us. And if we're satisfied with the way we are, that means we're not going to open our mouth and share the Gospel. 
If we're satisfied and we like the size that we are, that means we're not going to invite anybody else to it. It's not about the size. It's about being obedient to God and doing what God asks of us. A little test here. How many of you have neighbors? Raise your hand. Oh, almost every one of you. How many of you suppose that maybe some of your neighbors are unsaved and don't know Jesus? Raise your hand. Oh, come on. You know where this is going. Some of you don't want to lift your hand. You know where it's going, right? Suffice it to say that we know people that don't know Jesus and we need to open our mouth. They're not part of a fellowship. They don't know, they don't know the truth and we need to share it. And Jesus knows what He's asking of you when He asks you to do that. How many of you know that you're supposed to be praying and walking with Jesus and fellowship with Him every day? Raise your hand. You know you're supposed to be doing that, right? It's not something we're forced to do. You know what? Nobody forced me to want to talk to my wife before we got married. Nobody had to put a gun to my head and say, you really should call her. In fact, my freshman year, I called my mom several weeks into the school year and I said, hey, I found the girl I'm going to marry. And it's like it went, Phew. and my wife said, so, or my mom said, so how are your classes going? Mom, did you hear what I said? And just so you know, I married her four years later. So sometimes we just know, right? But the reality is, nobody had to put a gun to my head and say, you should call your sweetheart. That's something I wanted to do. Because I loved her. I wanted to talk with her. And in those days when we were apart, I was willing to pay the long distance. That's something we haven't heard of in years. This generation knows nothing of. I'll tell you one thing. Don, Don wore out her parents' long distance phone bill. I'll say that. $300 a month in those days. My goodness. Nobody has to force you to do something when you want to do it. He knows what He's asking of us. As a group, what has He asked of us as a church? To be the church. Not just selectively in certain areas of being the church, but in all the areas of being the church. Amen? It's not a smorgasbord Christianity. Take a little bit of serving over here, but not so much commitment and work day over here. A little bit more over here, but not, I don't like that, so I'm not gonna, I'll let someone else do that one. We treat Christianity as like it's a smorgasbord. And yet God says, wait a minute. That's not how it works. So, of course He knows what is going to be entailed in what He asks of us. He knew that the disciples would face a storm. He knew that it would be in the middle of the night. And He knew that there would be real fear. And I have to ask this question. Are those three things anything different than what He asks of you and I at times? No. Those things haven't changed. Not one iota. When God asks me something, I know that He knows what I'm going to face when I do it. I know that He knows that the timing ain't going to be just what I would choose. I know that He knows that I may be afraid of what He's asking of me. You know, for some of you, if I were to say, hey, we're going to go to Africa and we're going to minister among the Fulani tribe, you'd say, uh-uh. The Fulani tribe are some of the most militant Muslims that this world knows. And if they find out even a hint or just a, a breath of, that, of the fact that you're a believer, your head's chopped. Sign me up. Let's go. No, you'd say, no, forget it. There's fear there. But do you also realize that the most safe place that you and I can be is in the center of God's will? That's the most important, safest place you can be is in the center of God's will. Regardless of what obstacles you may face, how much the timing may be wrong, and no matter what fear you may possess. As I said earlier, when I hear these messages, we often think of Peter. But for a moment, think of us as a church. What is God asking of us? 
I think of summer as a not great opportunity. I'm thinking this summer we have some fill the field events. One of them's already on the wall out there for, for the month of June. On June 25th, he's going to jump through the wall of fire, and it's an opportunity to just to share faith and, and to see people come to know Jesus and hear stories of how God changes lives. And I can look back and say, you know what? That's a cool event. Yeah, I think I'm going to bring my kids and come. Or, as I say often, programs without prayer is just stuff on a calendar. We don't want to do stuff. We want to do things that God will use for His own glory. To bring joy to Himself. And so our outlet ought to be, hey, you know what? This is a great opportunity. The Gospel is going to be shared and I need to invite some friends and neighbors and co-workers and relatives that don't know Jesus. And perhaps maybe God would work in their lives and draw them to Himself and, and maybe they'll get saved. And at the very least, every one of us in this room should be praying for that. Because God has asked us to do that. What might be God asking us to do as a group, as a church? And here's the thing. It might be that God would use one of you in this group as He did with Peter. But what might God be asking us, yeah, even making us, telling us to do as a group? And so here's the question I asked, have to ask as I looked at this passage. Why didn't the group respond in obedience? Why didn't they necessarily just come out and walk on the water? Why didn't the whole group get out of the boat? Why, why, why didn't they just all just stop and say, hey, this is a cool experience. I think I'm going to go walk on the water towards the ghost. This sounds like blast. Let's do it. Why not? Look at verse 29. And he said, come. He wasn't just talking to Peter. He was talking to the whole group, right? The whole group that was in the boat, he said, come. And getting out of the boat, Peter walked on the water and came toward Jesus. You see, the church is not necessarily just one. It's a group of people who put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And I find it amazing over the years that even though it's an entire group, it's often an individual here or an individual there that seem to let God use them. We're quick to barrage Peter with all the, the humorous jokes and, and, and all the things that he did because he was so spontaneous. And but you know what? Peter got out of the boat. He got out! How cool is that? He got out! And he started walking on the water. Once again, did Jesus know what he was asking of Peter and the rest? Yeah. Did he know what it might entail? Of course he did. He's God. And Peter really reveals his humanity here. Let me ask you a question. Is it okay to be afraid? Yeah. In fact, I think if you're not afraid of some circumstances, you might be missing a you know, couple of fries short of a hat meal because there's some things that are really scary. And it's okay to be scary. But here's the thing. He says, but seeing the wind, he became frightened and beginning to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. This thing that Peter experienced is something that we can all relate to. Every one of us. I've asked this question a hundred times over the years. When did Peter begin to sink? When he took his eyes off Jesus and put it on the problem. I mean, it's right there. He became frightened and beginning to sink. He cried out. Why? Because he looked at the waves that were going on around him, and these, these the waves that were just tumultuous. And all of a sudden, he took his eyes off Jesus and put them on the waves around him. Because the wind was violent. When we take our eyes off Jesus as a group, that's when we begin to fail. That's why churches close their doors every year. Because their eyes are not on Jesus. 
you realize that 1,800 churches a year close their doors not to open again? That's a ton of churches. And I know there's a various host of reasons why. I get it. But a lot of them, not in every circumstance, but a lot of them is because their eyes aren't on Jesus. They're on what I want and what I think we should do and what I believe I want to accomplish and I, 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 rather than God, what is it that you want? But here's the thing. Verse 31. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and took hold of him and said to him, let me stop right there. I don't care where any of you are at with your walk with Jesus right now today at this moment. Let me rephrase that. I do care. But regardless of where you're at at this moment, if you're sinking, if your eyes are not on Him, and you feel like you're drowning, it's never too late to outstretch your arm towards Jesus. It's never too late until you're gone. But in this moment, Peter realizing that he's beginning to sink just says, Jesus, so beautiful. Immediately, Jesus stretched out His hand and took hold of him. You have little faith. Why did you doubt? Doesn't it come down to our trust in almost every circumstance of life? Do you trust Him? I, I'm telling you, I think we all struggle with trust. There's been moments in my life where I said, God, I know you can do absolutely anything. Not a hint of doubt. And then in the next circumstance, I'm like, wow, this is just huge. Well, how come I could look at him a minute ago and say it was perfect, and in the next moment, I'm doubting? It's my humanity. It's my view and where my eyes are, my, where my focus is at the moment. So I'm sitting there in the doctor's office, in fact, it wasn't, it wasn't even at the doctor. It was the morning of my surgery. He goes, are you ready for your triple bypass? Don and I both looked at him and goes, I, honest to God, did not know I was doing a triple bypass. I did not know that. This doctor thought this doctor, who thought this doctor, who thought that doctor had explained it all. And I just looked at him and says, all right, let's do it. I mean, what were you going to say? What are you, you going to do? You've got to do it. I mean, if you, if you didn't need it, you wouldn't be sitting there. Right? But there's that moment after Don leaves the room that I'm sitting there praying and I'm like, Lord, help me through this because I've got kids. I've got a wife. And I begin to doubt just for a moment that everything's going to go good because I'm diabetic for 30 years, because I watch everyone else, you know, my dad and my family struggle through with health issues, and I'm like, just for that slight moment, I wish I could say I'd never had a single shred of doubt, not, just, not even a little bit. It's all in God's hands, it's all fine. But there's just for a moment you say, Lord, help me trust you. Because in my flesh, there's that little bit of nervousness. You say, is that natural? Oh yeah, it's natural. But isn't God in control of everything, even that? He is, right? But our flesh wants to control stuff. Our flesh wants to say, hey, I got this. Our flesh says, hey, we can do this. Our flesh says, hey, this is nothing. But it's not about what you think you can do or accomplish in your flesh. It's about what God is trying to do in and through you, and do you trust Him to do it? Do you trust them? It says, immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and took hold of him. And it says, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? He says, why did you doubt? This is like, it's like going into the land of Canaan. He goes, why are you doubting? And he says, I, I, this, this is the land that I'm giving you. Why are you worried about the giants? Who cares about the giants? The giants don't matter right now. I already gave you this land, it's yours. 
because in our flesh, we want to control rather than let God control and taking Him at His word. And you'll realize that spans almost every aspect of life. From the spiritual to the physical. And he says, And when they got into the boat, the wind stopped. And those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, You are truly God's Son. Think about that for a moment. We said that God is a sovereign God. He can do whatever He wants, whatever He wants. Why? To bring joy to Himself. He says, through this circumstance, he goes, I just put you through a little test. I sent you in a boat, go out in the water, you encountered a storm, you got freaked out, you thought you saw a ghost when it was actually me, and you're fine. But I didn't know I was going to be fine. I was, I was scared about that little fact, Jesus. Right, you were. But he says, oh, you have little faith. Why do you doubt? Trust them. We need to trust Him. And He says, you are truly God's Son. He does what He does to bring glory to Himself so that we might see who He really is. I've said for years that God allows problems. And we can view that situation as a problem or a project. Either one, it's our choice. That circumstance that God has allowed, it can either be viewed as a problem or a project. If it's a problem, I'm going to sit there and worry and get frustrated and anxious and look at it as like something that's just so big and so hard to overcome. But if it's a project, we're going to trust God to get through it and He's going to help us through it. And when it's done, He turns that problem or project, depending on how we view it, into an opportunity to praise Him later. Because He's God. He's God. And look what he says, verse 34. And when they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret. And when the men of the, that place recognized him, they sent word into all that surrounded district and brought to him all who were sick and they who were pleading with him that they might just touch the fringe of his garment. And as many as touched it were cured. So think about this. Did Jesus send them out in the middle of the water just just for something to do for kicks and giggles? No. He really didn't. He sent them out because he had a job for them to do on the other side. What was the job? To go make the way, make a way to let everyone know that Jesus was coming and that Jesus was going to be doing some work there. He says as soon as they got to the other side, they, <laughs> they sent word into all the surrounding district and brought it all to him who were sick. Jesus was about to do something great in bringing healing to a land of people on the other side. And he was using all of his disciples to help carry out that work. Question, when God asks us as a group to go do something, is it about us? No. It's all about him. And we, just could be, we get to be part of what He is already at work doing. I don't know about you, but I want to be a part of what God's doing. Anybody else? I want to be a part of what God is doing. The plans aren't mine. Mark Twain said, if you aim at nothing, you're sure to hit it. So we set some goals, but God can obviously change the goals anytime He wants because He's God. Right? So we'll set some goals this summer because we're going to do some things that will create an opportunity to invite those that need to know Jesus and to be able to come and hear stories of changed lives. And that's all good and well, but God has the opportunity to do whatever we want. He can twist and change, and we just can be, get to be a part of what God is already at work doing. And I can sit back and watch some other individual do it, like how the other disciples did with Peter. Or I can say, hey, I'm in this group too and I want to be part of what God's doing. I don't want you, but I want to challenge you to be part of what the, the group that wants to see God do something. Don't count on a Peter to do something that you should be doing. Don't count on Peter doing it all because, well, God wants you to do it. Don't, don't count on just someone else being 
willing to stand up when you should be standing up. Because he's talking to the group here. And I'm talking to the group. There are no all-stars in this group at Harvest. There are no like, you know, seven-figure income Grand Slam hitters in this group. No all-star QBs. No incredible executives that get to call the shots. We are all part of the group. All on the same floor doing what God has asked us to do. And don't wait for someone else to do what God's wanting you to do as part of this group. I, I think in closing, I think oftentimes over the years, there's been so many dreams over the years. Dreams like, oh, we'd love to have a gymnasium. Love to have a fellowship hall. We'd love to do some things out here that would draw some new people in. Or, you know, help us as a church in more rooms and more space or more education, more teaching opportunities and more this, more that. And we sit back and we wait for a Peter to make the move. We sit back and wait for Peter to get out and do something. When God is saying to all of us, what about you? I'll just say it. I think there's enough money in every church to do whatever it is that God wants us to do. I 1,000% believe that. I 1,000% believe that if God said, build a building tomorrow, that somebody in this church could put the bill for it. I do believe that. Now let me just say, I don't know who gives what in this church. That's between Julie and Paul, the two financial people. I don't know a clue who gives what. But I have to absolutely 1,000% believe that if God said do this, I believe that somebody could write the check for it. I, do believe, I believe that. Why? Because I've seen it a thousand times in a hundred different churches. I believe that. But we hold it for a rainy day just in case. We hold it because, well, someone else will do it. We hold it because, well, I, I, might, I might need it later. What is God asking us to do? I'm not saying God is telling us to build a gym. Although I'd love to see a fellowship hall slash gym for this ministry. It would it, be an incredible tool. I would love to see us have some seed plant for a youth pastor so the next generation of teenagers who, by the way, we have about 10 or 12 of them coming up in the next year that we're going to have as teenagers in this church. I'd love to see us have a youth pastor. What would it require? Fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 seed money for a couple of years till we got it going? Someone could foot that bill. I think God is asking us to do a lot of things and we sit back in fear and doubt and expecting someone else, a Peter, to do what God has asked us to do. I hope our best days are in front of us. I hope that we're not as a group of people waiting for a Peter to step up and do what God is asking us to do. We'll miss out on the blessings. We'll miss out on seeing God do great things if that's the case. And if our best days are behind us, what hope do we have? What does God want you to do and to be a part of? I, I don't know what that may be. But there's things that we've talked about as a church for years that we just kind of let slip to the sides. Maybe next year. Maybe the year after. Maybe never. Oh well because we're waiting for someone else to do it. I'm thankful that God does use the individual. But in this case, He's talking to the group. And I think there's times God's talking to us as the group, but we're viewing it as He's talking to someone else. And He's saying, you have little faith, why do you doubt? What is God asking of us? I think that's something we need to get on our knees and start asking. Start praying fervently about so that we as a church can see a God do a great thing in our midst. I don't want status quo. I don't want to be satisfied with good is good enough. I don't want to just say, oh well, things are okay. We're not on the verge of any splits. Bills are paid. Oh well, good is good enough. I don't want that. 
How many think God is accept God is is okay with that? Anybody? No, God's not good with that. What does God want to do in and through you as part of this group called Harvest Bible Fellowship? We need to start praying about that. Say, well, Pastor, you have some ideas? Yeah, come see me. All kinds of ideas, folks. There is never a shortage of ideas of things that we could do to see God's work go forward. But pray about what God wants you to do to be a part of it. Lord, I ask God that you would speak to our hearts. Lord, I am thankful for the Peters, but I'm also thankful for the group, more so. Lord, there's a lot of ability in this group. A lot of... Lord, just flat out hard workers, sacrificial people, many who have given for years... They've been faithful. But Lord, I don't believe that You're done with us. I still believe that there's a harvest yet to come. There's still work to be done. There's still something You want to do with the group. Just like You did with the group of the disciples. When they got to the other side, they went out and gathered all those that were sick. He wanted everyone to be part of the harvest. And God, I'd love to see everyone in this group to be a part of the harvest of what you're going to do one day. Lord, just I know it's an application, just a practical application of what we see here, but God, help us not to wait for a Peter to step up. Lord, may you use each and every one of us to accomplish your will. So God, speak to our hearts. As heads are bowed and eyes are closed, just for a moment this morning. I know it's a little bit of a different twist on the Scripture of what we normally hear from this passage. He's speaking to the group. What is it that God wants to do with you? The bigger question is, are you willing to let God do it? You say, Pastor, this morning, I, I, I don't know what God may have. I don't know what He's asking. But this morning, God's challenged my heart. Pray for me that I might be willing and open and available to, for God to use me. Anyone like that this morning? Yes, all over all over. Maybe you haven't been willing. Maybe you've been scared. Maybe you've been fearful. That's all normal. But remember who Jesus is. He is God in the flesh. And God says, I got you. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Oh, you have little faith. Don't doubt. I'm here for you. Maybe this morning you need, several of us need to just take a moment and say, God, remove the fear. Remove the doubt. Remove the lack of trust. And entrust God to do what only God can do. Anyone else say, Pastor, pray for me. That's my desire. That's my heart. Yes. In the back, on the side. Just take a moment and pray. Say, God, forgive me. God, remember, James says, the him that knows to do right and doesn't do it, it's sin. Maybe this morning, say, God, forgive my lack of faith. God, forgive my lack of trust. God, forgive my doubting. Maybe there's something that God wants to do in and through you as part of this group to do something big. I don't know. There's all kinds of projects that would help us move forward as a church. There's all kinds of things that would promote the gospel if we'd be willing to just give and do what God asks us to do. Let's all stand to our feet this morning. Lord God, I thank You for each one who's opened their heart to you this morning in this subject. Thank you, Lord, for how you use your word to challenge us. But not only challenge us, change us, Lord. Lord God, I pray that you would be with each one who raised their hand, their heart towards you this morning, Lord. That they might see your hand at work in their lives. That they might sense your presence. And that they might be able to take another step in faith and obedience, Lord. Remove the doubt. Remove the lack of trust. Remove the fear, Lord. So that we might see you do great things as you did with the disciples once they got to the other side. The work that only you could do and you used every one of them to help you do it. I know you don't need us, Lord, but you desire us for us to be used with you. So Lord, work in our hearts. Draw us closer to you this morning. 
And Lord, I pray that You would do great things in the years to come. The weeks ahead. The days ahead. Lord, that we might see Your hand at work here at Harvest Bible Fellowship in this group, this local body of believers, this church. And we'll praise You for it. For it's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen.